Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the Indian Solution to the Policy Problem. My name is Jillian Kilfoyle, and I'm the Girls Action National Programs Coordinator. In a couple of minutes, I will be passing the mic to Cassandra Opikopiu Wajunta. We are fortunate to have Cassandra with us today. And I'm happy to see some familiar names joining us for today's webinar. For those returning, welcome back. For those of you who are new to our webinar series, I wanted to briefly introduce you to the Girls Action Foundation before passing things along to Cassandra. Very quickly, the Girls Action Foundation is a national nonprofit that works to empower girls. We are based in Montreal where we run local girls programs and we work with some 250 partners across the country who also run their own girls programs. We also provide leadership training, organize networking events, and do other things that connect girls and young women. In terms of impact, nationally, we reach about 60,000 girls and young women. Girls and young women located in remote, marginalized, and urban communities, including the North. This webinar was initiated by one of Girls Action's four national network working groups. Girls Action has set up working groups for programmers working with indigenous girls and young women, working with newcomer and immigrant girls and young women, racialized girls and young women, and a working group for programmers located in rural, northern, or isolated communities. These working groups meet over the phone monthly to identify trends and gaps in the sector across the country. The group works together to initiate activities to address these gaps. The working group of programmers working with Indigenous girls and young women has initiated uh, the idea behind today's webinar. <laughs> this webinar is part of Girls Action's webinar series. We have a few webinars coming up in the next week. October 29th, Les filles au Canada, problématiques majeures et conseils pour des programmes qui ont de l'impact. This webinar will be offered in French only. On November 4th, there will be another webinar entitled Getting Sex Savvy, Building Capacity on LGBTQ Issues for Service Providers Working with Newcomer Youth. And following that webinar on November 20th, there will be another webinar entitled, No One Can Tell Our Stories But Us, Racialized Girls Making Media. Go to www.girlsactionfoundation.ca slash webinars for more info or to register. Our agenda for today's webinar. Uh, Cassandra is one of our presenters for this series. Just before introducing her, I'd like to walk you through the interactive side of today's webinar. You'll see on your screen a number of different information displays and panels that will be changing throughout the presentation. On the right hand of your screen, you'll see a panel or window titled Q&A. Here is where you can ask questions and interact with Cassandra, myself, or other participants. If you have a question or comment during the presentation, type it into the Q&A box. Hit enter and it will be recorded there. By default, the question will be visible to everyone. If you would prefer to submit your question privately, click on the down arrow at the bottom of the Q&A box and select my name, Jillian Kilfoyle or Miriam Zaidi instead of all participants. That way the question will only come to us, the Girls Action Foundation staff. After Cassandra speaks, 
We will be opening the Q&A period to answer all of your questions. As the moderator, I'll be keeping track of everything that has been asked in the Q&A box and direct them to Cassandra during this Q&A period. I also wanted to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded, including the question period. This will be posted online. I'll send everyone a link to the recording. Finally, at the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up. Please fill it out. We'd love to read your here. We'd love to hear your feedback um, and know how we can improve this process moving forward. With that covered, I'd like to introduce Cassandra. Cassandra is from Canoe Lake Cree First Nation and was raised in Meadow Lake in northern Saskatchewan. She has a certificate in Indian Communication Arts and a BA in Journalism, which she earned in 2009 from the University of Regina, where she received the James M. Minifi Award for being the most distinguished graduate in her class. In 2012, she completed her Master's of Public Administration, where she focused on Aboriginal post-secondary education and analyzed post-secondary student support programs. She is now a third-year PhD candidate and was recently awarded a CIHR award worth $108,000 to fund her doctoral research entitled the Indian Solution to the Policy Problem, Developing an Indigenous Policymaking Model to Address First Nations Health and Education Disparities. In addition to her studies, Cassandra has served as a board member with a number of organizations, including YWCA Canada and YWCA Regina, Planned Parenthood, co-chair of the SIN Youth Council, chairperson of the National Aboriginal Caucus, and founder and president of the University of Regina's Indigenous Students Association. She is also the, <coughs> excuse me, the associate director of the Indigenous People's Health Research Center in Regina, Saskatchewan. We are very happy to have Cassandra here today partnering with us and sharing her important work and research with all of us. Thank you very much, Cassandra. I'll pass it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so hopefully everybody can see um, on your screen what I'm presenting. It should look like a, a big mind map on a whiteboard, um, and the title on the bottom should be Pomasuan Policymaking. Um, <clears throat> for the sake of cooperating with technology, um, We've had to, this is originally designed as a Prezi presentation, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Prezi, it's just a different presentation software than PowerPoint, for example. And it allows you to do sort of more like mind mapping on a giant um, whiteboard, which is really useful if you're trying to show relationships. So for my purposes today, um, that's kind of what we'll do, but it will be displayed to you as a PDF. Um, just so it's a little bit quicker. Um, as we move through, what I'll do is I'll take you through, you know, part by part, but we'll basically be starting in the upper right-hand corner talking about Indigenous policymaking. Then I'll go through the policymaking process, kind of following that clockwise. Then I'll talk a little bit about First Nations health and education. Um, my methodology, and then on the far left-hand side, those two big blocks where you see kind of like X's and checks, and then you see sort of a logic model beneath that. If we have time, I'll briefly discuss some examples of how 
um, indigenous knowledge can start to be utilized in policies and programs. And then I'll wrap it up with, um, with some examples of sort of why I think these teachings are so important and what the big idea of this kind of research is. And I just want to really thank the Girls Action Foundation for um, inviting me today. And I apologize if any of you have heard me do this presentation before. It's based off of my doctoral research and I've been all over the place. <clears throat> this is actually my seventh presentation this week, so I will apologize if my voice is giving out. And if any of this is not interesting to you, feel free to kind of tune out for a minute and then uh, tune back in um, to what grabs your attention. Okay, so I'm just highlighting here, um, I've zoomed in on, uh, the title of my research is The Indian Solution to the Policy Problem. But what I'm really talking about is Pamasawin policy making, and Pamasawin is a Cree word that I'll get into um, in a few minutes. So now you should see a slide that says, um, who are you again? <laughs> and uh, though they gave me a lovely and humbling introduction, I always think it's important, and it's just a part of my research methods that I um, also remind you where I come from and that you understand the cultural grounding and perspective that I bring with me. Because there are opportunities that come with that and there are also limitations that come with that. So I am a member of Canoe Lake Cree First Nation, um, which is located in Treaty 10 territory in North Saskatchewan. That's the top arrow there. Um, you can see we're a fairly one of the most northernest bands in Saskatchewan. Uh, we're located in the Meadow Lake Tribal Council area and we were one of the last numbered treaties signed. And I grew up just south of Canoe Lake in Meadow Lake, which is on the border of Treaty 10 and Treaty 6 area. For my studies, I relocated down to the Regina area, which is Treaty 4 territory. That's the bright yellow um, section there towards the bottom. And uh, I now reside in Fort Capel, which is near, which is on the other side of Echo Lake from my husband's home community, which that third arrow goes to, Standing Buffalo, Dakota First Nation. So this is where I always like to add in my old joke, which is, what do you get when a Cree woman marries a Dakota man and you can't agree on the last name? Well, you get a really long last name like Opikikiu Wajenta. So, um, that, that's why the last name is so long. Um, I won't go over my credentials, but I'll just remind you of them because to me, um, they're, they're a little bit of a limitation. They're not so much a badge of honor as I see them as this is all that I know and it's just little pieces here and there. So I've got my certificate in communications, the BA in journalism, the master's in public admin, and then I'm, of course I'm doing my PhD now. So I'm somewhat limited in terms of this is not something that I've been studying forever, but I have been passionate about First Nations issues. Um, and my research that I'm doing now is really tying that work together. You'll also see pictures there of what I jokingly call my research team. And I'm working from home today. So if you hear barking in the background, it's not because I'm being attacked by a pack of wild coyotes or wolves. It's because I have five dogs and they're outside in the yard. So hopefully they'll cooperate and be quiet um, for most of this presentation. So I just switched the slide and hopefully you can see this. I always start my presentations with this quote because I think it's important to understand the perspective that many indigenous groups across the world are coming from when we're having any discussion about rights, policies, programming, et cetera, that relates to us. And of course, not all Indigenous communities or people are the same. So take what you want from this and leave the rest. But this is a statement from the Assembly of First Nations in 2013. And I'll just, I'll just briefly cover it here. It says, we, the original peoples of this land, know the Creator put us here. The Creator gave us our spiritual beliefs our languages, our culture, and a place on Mother Earth. We have maintained our freedom, our languages, and our traditions from time immemorial. 
The Creator has given us the right to govern ourselves and the right to self-determination. The rights and responsibilities given to us by the Creator cannot be altered or taken away by any other nation. So I, I have a question for you that I just want you to think about and maybe it will generate some discussion later on, but I just want you to reflect on that statement and I'll go back to it here um, and just think about what, what grabs your attention. For me, there's some important parts here. One, that the source of the rights that Indigenous people have in Canada come from a place higher than ourselves, and that's the creator or a higher power or whatever you want to call that belief system. The second part that's really important to me is that um, these traditions, these rights, this freedom comes from time immemorial. And the third part that's really important and perhaps the most important and most contested is the last sentence there where it says, these rights and responsibilities cannot be altered or taken away by any other nation. So if this is the perspective of Indigenous groups around the world, or at least the First Nations here in Canada, you start to see where conflict um, in the policy system comes from. The perspective of First Nations is that these are rights that could never have been negotiated away by treaty or, or by um, treaty processes because in our understanding they're gifts that we have that we can't even give away to anybody. And so that's where when we talk about treaties, you often hear First Nations people say, well, just to the depth of a plow is what we gave the white settlers, as in, we give the use you know, and maintenance of the land, but it's not ours to give away. And our rights and responsibilities and self-determination are also not something we're capable of giving away. So that leads me to indigenous policy making. And this is, just a set, this is just a brief sort of overview, but prior to um, first contact, Indigenous groups did have ways of making decisions and developing our policies and our values and communities. And though it differed from community to community, we had criteria for how we would evaluate um, policy options or um, choices that we had to make. Some of the more common ones that you often see reflected in communities were an accountability for future generations. So really measuring over generational time period um, what, the outpack, what the impact or output was going to be of a de decision. Um, the second one that I have up there as an example is responsible environmental stewardship, which is just a fancy way of saying land and environment. So many Indigenous groups looked at when they were making a decision, how is this going to affect the environment around us and the land around us? Because that was a very um, important relationship, a very central one. And another thing that's quite interesting is that decisions in communities were often built through consensus with the requirement to consider perspectives from everybody, including women, youth, and elders. People ask, how would youth or children be involved in the policy making process, well, they were encouraged to listen in. They were encouraged to sit there and listen and take in the decision making process. And the reason for that was so that you create an informed citizenship down the road. So instead of waiting for people to turn 18 or 16 or 21 before they're considered an adult, you start working with children from a very young age to make sure that they're an informed citizenship. Um, women had a very central role. Many First Nations communities were actually matrilineal or matriarchal, so they, they um, uh, were really based around the women. Um, some of the decision-making authority in some communities was actually a senior council of, of elderly women. Um, and then, of course, elders. And the reason consensus was important in a lot of communities was because you needed everybody in the community to ultimately talk through an issue and reach some sort of agreement to move forward because communities were smaller. So if you didn't have anybody agreeing, you wouldn't have harmony in the community. 
And consensus doesn't mean that you were forced to agree. It just means that that was the ultimate goal. If you didn't agree with the decision that was made in a community, you had the option to exit the community if you felt that strongly about it, or you had the option to just sort of abstain from that, um, that decision and those impacts. Finally, maybe we should back up a minute, and I like to always do this, but what's the difference between policy versus law versus practices? And the truth is, they're not so different. So let's look at a definition of what policy is. So this is a pretty classical definition of public policy from uh, Howlett and Ramesh, 1995. And it says, a set of interrelated decisions taken by a political actor, a group of actors, blah, 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 blah. Um, basically, the highlights here is that public policy or policy in general are just decisions taking, taken by a person or a group of people related to how they're going to achieve something where they should ideally have the power to make those decisions. That's it. So it's just a group of people making decisions with the authority to make the decisions. That's essentially what policy is. So moving back to wrap up with Indigenous policy making, the classical goal of, of policy as we understand it is to create the good life. And sometimes we don't always see that reflected in the people we elect to public office or policymakers, but that's essentially what they're elected to do, is to create the good life for us. In the Cree language, we have a similar concept, and it's called Pimasin, and it means the seeking of the good life. So we strive for the same thing in Indigenous communities, and that's what we are, are working towards, creating the good life for our people as well. Many other Indigenous communities have similar terms based um, on similar principles. So when we think of policy as maybe this, it's a bunch of white guys in a back room making decisions on our behalf and that it came over with early settlers and explorers, it's not true. People around the world develop policy from a variety of cultural backgrounds and we all tend to do it for the same reasons, creating the good life. So I talked about some traditional values there, intergenerational planning, the role of women and children in decision making, responsible environmental stewardship. But I just want you to kind of think from your perspective, what are some other traditional values that you've seen reflected in Indigenous groups? Maybe list them or start thinking about them. I know one that I haven't talked too much about, but I briefly mentioned is the role of language. Language is a really important um, value in terms of maintaining it for Indigenous people. Okay, so to flash forward, because I don't want to spend too much time on a history lesson here and we don't have too much time today, I've wrapped up hundreds of years of history here as looking at how did Indigenous policy making shift post-contact up until about the 1970s. So during um, the treaty signings, Indigenous governments thought that we were signing nation-to-nation -nation agreements, not dissolving our decision-making authority or self-determination. And that comes back to that first slide that I talked about. These were not rights that we could negotiate or give away. We really, Indigenous people were under the perspective that we are doing nation-to-nation -nation agreements. Uh, origin, people are often under this conception that Indigenous people were just wiped out um, and decimated by early contact. But actually, the original relationship between Indigenous people and newcomers to the New World um, was cooperation because early settlers and explorers really had to learn how to survive in the harsh North American climate. So. In the beginning, Indigenous groups were seen as an asset in terms of they were reliant on them for their survival. But of course, once settler numbers grew and land became an issue, um, control was forcefully removed from, the commun from First Nations communities and usurped by the Canadian government or settler government. And there's a quote here from a wonderful book by Joanna Piscanu. 
Um, if you want to look up the book, I'd highly recommend it. It talks about lots of public policy issues related to First Nations people and the context and history. The book is called Taking Back Our Spirits. But the quote that I have here is, the eradication of the Indigenous population by eradicating Indigenous differences and public policy became the weapon of choice to deal with the Indian problem. So this is where we see that phrase being born, the Indian problem, as in for settler governments, how do we start to get rid of these people or deal with these people now that we're in competition for land or resources with them and no longer fully reliant on them. And she's really highlighting there that public policy became the tool that they used to start undermining the Indigenous population. Flashing forward now to post-1970s, what is policymaking in relation to Indigenous people like now? Well, to summarize briefly, First Nations groups in Canada have limited agency or devolution of program delivery, which means we're still subject to the colonial framework that we were pre-1970s. We're still subject to the Indian Act. We're still a part of a Western policymaking system that doesn't really acknowledge our values that I mentioned before. And most of the responsibility that First Nations have is just related to delivering programs within set frameworks. And there's exceptions to that, but generally that, that's still what we have to work within. And this is a great quote here, um, and it's kind of the dirty laundry of policymakers, but we rarely critique or deconstruct um, policy culture itself, and standard language, procedures, et cetera, continue to be perceived to encourage economy and efficiency, but those two things can often compromise depth and diversity. And that's just saying basically, as policymakers, we rarely stop and actually look at how are we making decisions what are some of the values embedded in the culture that we just take for granted? And what are we compromising by not looking at those things? So to, uh, to sort of wrap this up for you, there's kind of four stages to how the policy process generally works. The first stage is you set your strategic goal. The second stage is you develop a policy process for how you're going to achieve that goal. And the third stage is you have operational goals, so sub-objectives. And then you have outcomes from the programs or policies that should be feeding into your strategic goal. Up until the 1970s, basically the strategic goal of the Canadian government was to, like Joanne said, eradicate the Indigenous population, as horrible as a goal of that, as that was. So they set up a policy process to do that. So it excludes Indigenous groups from the policymaking process. Then they created policies to support those strategic goals. And in the, the second circle there, I have an example of the residential school policy. So if you go to the third circle, what was the basic operational goal of that policy? Well, it was to kill the Indian, save the child. What was the outcome in the fourth circle? from that operational goal and policy? Well, it was the destruction of cultural identity, family structures, and decision-making authority, which of course feeds into the strategic goal of eradicating the Indigenous population. So what I'm trying to illustrate there is that as horrific as this um, cycle is, it was effective. This process was effective at undermining the Indigenous population. It was consistent. Here's where we start to run into problems. So here's the policy process now, post-1970. So it's still the same process, strategic goals, policy process, operational goals, outcomes, etc. But things have changed. So now the strategic goal of the Canadian government is Indigenous self-determination. And that's been reiterated by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. So we might not see this reflected, but theoretically this is what the overall goal of our Canadian government is. It's Indigenous self-determination. So drastically different than what the goal was um, previously in terms of eradication. Here's where the issues come in. If you look at the second circle, has the policy process changed? 
No, it hasn't. Indigenous people still are not represented in our political system. We still are under the Indian Act and colonial structures. We still um, don't have a voice, an empowered, self-determined voice in the process. So the process is inherently flawed. So it's got a limited capacity to meet new strategic goals. The example I give here is of the PSSSP, which is the Post-Secondary Student Support Program, and I won't get into that too much. But anyway, coming out of that program, for example, you may have operational goals that do or do not align with your strategic goals. So for example, the goal of the Post-Secondary Student Support Program, or PSSSP, which provides funding to students, First Nations students each year, the goal of that program is to employ First Nation, improve First Nations employability. And the reason that that goal actually falls short is improving First Nations employability is not necessarily the same as Indigenous self-determination. What does that mean, improve First Nations employability? If you're just getting First Nations people into lower level jobs, um, you're probably not encouraging self-determination. It's also important to note that that program wasn't designed with an altruistic goal of, look, we've done all this horrible damage with residential schools, we better figure out a way to, to improve the life of Indigenous people. The goal originally with that program was, well, let's look at ways to get them into the workforce because it looks like they're going to be around for a while. So not quite in line with Indigenous self-determination. And what's the outcome of that program? Well, it's falling short of strategic goals. So that program has been capped at 2% growth, the budget, since 1996. So that means that the pot of dollars that students have to go to for funding from this program is capped at 1996 levels. How much has changed in the, in the last 20 years? Inflation, tuition costs alone are at least 4% increases each year. Um, the cost of living, et cetera. So it hasn't actually kept pace. So that means that you've got more and more students, because we've got a booming First Nations population trying to go to school each year, but you have dollars that don't keep pace with that demand. So we're not feeding into increasing Indigenous self-determination. So the analogy, just to wrap this up for you here, is I like to say it's like a dirty filter. You can take any great idea you want, and Indigenous self-determination is a fabulous goal, but as soon as you start putting it through this process, it starts to fall apart, and whatever comes through the other end is not as good as what you started with. So this is the policy problem we're left with. Both the health and education outcomes for First Nations people in Canada are consistently poorer than those of non-First Nations citizens, despite numerous policies. And these failures have led to Indigenous scholars calling for an examination of the policy process that looks at systemic and foundational rather than just attitudinal and incidental solutions. So just to point out, there's actually three problems in that statement. One, poor health outcomes. Two, poor education outcomes. And three, the failure of policies themselves to actually address and correct these outcomes. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, I like to just point out why am I looking at all three together? Well, health and education are key determinants of well-being for a population, and improvement in those areas would lead to an improved Human Development Index score for First Nations in Canada. That's actually how they compare um, countries around the world, using an HDI score, the quality of life. <clears throat> Two, education is a really key determinant of health outcomes. So any improvement you make in education often carries over into improvements in health outcomes for people. If you want to learn more about social determinants of health, there's a reading I suggest from Charlotte Redding and Fred Ween from 2009, and it's just called Social Determinants of Aboriginal Health. <clears throat> the third that we've talked about is that the policy process itself has started revealing its limitations. Fourth, 
health and education outcomes for First Nations people are actually a precursor to us having improved economic outcomes and self-government capacity. So before you can talk about a population improving its economic outlook or having self-government capacity, you need to be looking at do they have basic things? Are they a healthy population? Do they have the educational expertise to be able to, um, for example, manage an economic endeavor? So you need to have these things in place or be working on them at the same time that you're working on economic outcomes and self-government. Finally, the federal government itself has played a direct role in creating these poor outcomes as a result of its poor policies. So I believe there's an ownership on our governments to really be looking at this issue. And finally, our Canadian government has also repeatedly espoused that these policy areas and self-determination in general for First Nations are important and critical issues on their policy agenda. So a brief snapshot of for the state of First Nations education in Canada, um, we suffer from a 72% dropout rate on reserve. So for children, it's First Nations children attending school on reserve, and there's still a high percentage who are, 64%. You are more likely to drop out than you are to succeed, which is really depressing. And that's really uh, shameful considering that the non-First Nations dropout rate in Canada is closer to 8%. So uh, you've got a 90% chance um, of succeeding in school if you are uh, non-First Nations compared with only a 30% chance if you are. Uh, what makes that a little bit more shameful is that Canada's dropout rate is actually one of the lowest in the world, 3.8% lower than the average for other OECD countries. So we have a, a, an education system here that has it figured out for the most part, but that hasn't translated, obviously, into outcomes for First Nations children who don't experience the educational system in the same way. And finally, the university education gap, so completed university education between First, Nation, First Nations and non-First Nations, and I think this data is actually Aboriginal versus non-Aboriginal, uh, has widened in the last 10 years from 14 to 15 percent. So actually the gap is getting bigger because we're not keeping pace. Health, in terms of a snapshot of First Nations health, again, we see poor outcomes here. Life expectancy has risen for Aboriginal people, but on every health status measure and condition, we still tend to be worse than that of the overall Canadian population. Um, so higher rates of HIV, diabetes, infant mortality, suicide, tuberculosis, obesity, and depression. And here's just some, um, some actual numbers to back that up. So I'll just highlight a couple, but they're all comparing either the First Nations rate to the national rate. For suicide, you've got 24 suicides per 100,000 people. The national rate is half that, 11.6 per 100,000 people. For tuberculosis, you've got 27.9 per 100,000 in the First Nations population, compared with only 1.9 per 100,000. For the non-Aboriginal population in Canada. So just some stats there to, to show you the, the magnitude of the differences that I'm talking about. Now, here's what's really interesting. Uh, indigenous health, when you look at Canada, the US, Australia, and New Zealand, and we tend to all make policy in very similar ways. You can see, going across the left-hand side, we've got Canada, the U.S., Australia, New Zealand. Going across the top, you've got life expectancy and the U.N. human development ranking that I talked about earlier. In Canada, if we look at the factors that they consider in the human development ranking, education, health, etc., uh, the First Nations population in Canada ranks 32nd in the world. Um, it's actually closer to, I think, 72nd now. Uh, which puts us among third world conditions, whereas Canada ranks as one of the top 10 countries to live in. And if you look at uh, number eight, and if you look at the other countries, it's the same. So the American Indian or Alaskan Native population ranks 30th um, in the world compared with the U.S. itself, quality of life ranking at uh, top 10. Australia 
you've got ranking as quality of life about number four in the world, and for the Aboriginal population being isolated itself, so looking at just those conditions, 103rd. And same with New Zealand, they make it into the top 20 as a country, but the Maori population is left behind in those third world conditions of 73rd. So we see that not only is this an issue in Canada, but it's an issue in other countries as well. So <clears throat> to start kind of wrapping up here, um, this is just getting back to what I talked about before, but that Settler values, Eurocentric values, still tend to dominate the policymaking process, and we need to start looking at how we can fold Indigenous realities into the governing logic um, and start utilizing Indigenous knowledge in how we make public policy. So I won't spend too much time on this because it's not as relevant for you guys, but if you have questions about it, I'm happy to answer them. I'm using an Indigenous research methodology which means that for my research, I'm centering it on Indigenous knowledge and talking to Indigenous policymakers. Um, yeah, and comparing those four countries since they share a similar colonial context. Brief definition of what Indigenous research methodology is. Um, basically, it's got two goals. One, uh, it challenges me as an Indigenous researcher to articulate my research paradigms and my data collection methods, while also serving the struggle for Indigenous self-determination. So there's a somewhat political aspect to the work. And it involves four stages that I have to go through. Prepping myself as a researcher, prepping my research. Third, Indigenous epistemology, so basing my um, approach to research on Indigenous values. And fourth, giving back, research must benefit the community, and that's why I'm really happy to do um, these types of presentations when asked. And this is the overall research question that I'm left asking after I give all that information. Is there an Indigenous-centered method for developing effective policies that has applicability in the present? So that's the question that I'm hoping to identify. Um, I won't get into this because we're running out of time here, but this is our strategic plan for the research center I work at. And on the right-hand side, we are using Indigenous knowledge to actually measure whether or not we're being successful as a research center. So we measure our three groups, students, communities, and researchers, across four areas to see if we're succeeding. Uh, Learning over the short term, how do we know if we're succeeding based on what they should be learning? Actions over the medium term, so how do we know we're succeeding? What actions would we see from them? The black area is how would these groups be feeling if we know we're doing our job on an ongoing basis? And the fourth area is impact over the long term, how would we know if we're succeeding? So for communities, for example, over the short term, we measure in their learning do they have knowledge of Indigenous health research projects? Over the medium term for actions for communities in the yellow area there, we look for do they have informed policies and partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. So that's us utilizing Indigenous knowledge. And finally, and I won't spend any time on this because like I said, we're short on time, but that program, the PSSSP that I talked about, if you actually analyzed it through an Indigenous lens, you would measure and build a program based on values such as autonomy and community, so balancing those two things, self-determination, uh, intergenerational, that's how long you would measure outcome, and looking at the interconnectedness of what you're doing, and gender. When that program was developed, it didn't take into account any of those things, and that's what the chart um, is trying to point out to you there and sort of why the program is falling short now. If we did redevelop that program looking at these things, you see that with those check marks, you start to understand how the program could be improved had we based it on an Indigenous lens. So we'd have a balance of the right of the individual. We would, for self-determination, we would see that reflected in the actual goal. Perhaps we would recognize it as a treaty right. For the intergenerational, we would be looking at a program like this over 10 years. We'd have sustainable dollars for it. Interconnected, we would understand that that program has an impact on health outcomes and measure that. 
And for gender, we look at how are people using it? How are men and women accessing that program from a First Nations community? And finally, to wrap up here, I like to point out this study because I think it starts to hint at why we need to look at things and how we make decisions beyond just developing more programs. So this is a case study looking at youth suicide rates amongst BC First Nations. They looked at 196 bands who had widely varying rates. Some bands had virtually no suicides, while other bands had suicides that were 800 times the national average. Typically, if we were just doing this the way regular policymakers would do, we would say, all right, so that means we need to increase suicide prevention programming. Bam, let's develop a suicide prevention program and putting it in. But this group of researchers didn't look at that. They said, let's score these communities on their levels of cultural continuity, which is basically their ability to have a community identity and strong cultural ties. So they looked at these measures. Is there self-government, involvement in land claims, ban control of education, health services, are there cultural facilities, and are there basic police and fire services? And what they found was that communities with all six factors had a lower rate of youth suicide, while those without any of the factors had the highest rate. So I just ask you to ask yourself, what do those six things have to do with suicide? And why do you think that there's a correlation? And what the researchers found is that communities that have these things have some sort of state of health and self-determination and some level of Indigenous knowledge and, and community strength that they draw upon, which gives you an overall healthier, supported community um, than if you just isolated suicide prevention programming, for example. So they really point out, again, we need to look at how we're making decisions and what those big picture ideas are. Okay, so to wrap up, what's the big idea that I'm trying to get at here? Well, I'm trying to stress that research related to Indigenous health and education policy tends to just focus on making more policy recommendations, relying on policy as a tool for affecting that change without actually looking at how appropriate is that tool? How do we formulate it? What are its limitations and how could it be improved? Finally, I think we need to do that if we really want to advance real Indigenous self-determination. We need to stop using the same tools that keep falling short and we need to develop new ones if we want to actually get to Indigenous self-determination. I also hope that by doing these things, we improve the health and education outcomes for Indigenous people. So I think there's an international application here because all countries suffer from this, and that's because we're all doing things the same way for the most part. And I like to quote Buzz Lightyear and say, to infinity and beyond, what is my top secret agenda here? My top secret agenda is not so secret. It's that I think that these ideas are not just great for improving Indigenous policies, but they're just dang good ideas for improving public policy for all of us in general. We would all benefit from making policy on a longer term lens. We would all benefit from looking at how, how do these things influence the environment. And we would all benefit from including um, gender outcomes in the policy making process, for example, more often. So I'll leave you with that, and the last question I ask you to just maybe reflect on is how do these ideas or how can these ideas inform your everyday work, and if there's anything useful that you can take away from what I presented today. And with that, I will pass it back. We're almost to 2 p.m., um, but I just wanted to give everyone a moment. If you had any burning questions, we may have time for one or two from Cassandra. Um, so I'll just give you a moment to think of any questions that you may have. If so, you can write into the Q&A and we'll try to uh, field one of those, one or two of those for Cassandra. In the meantime, Cassandra, um, I'm just interested, uh, you said you did many presentations this week and I'm just wondering how your work, your research, this presentation, um, how, what's, what are the reactions like to it, um, and are those re reactions different for, uh, between 
indigenous and, and non-indigenous people that you're presenting for? Uh, that's a really good question. And I'd say for most indigenous people, uh, I get a lot of head nodding, a lot of fist bumps after. And I think it's just because although this, this isn't really groundbreaking stuff, um, for indigenous people, it's just nice to hear articulated, yes, this is the framework we're trying to work in. Yes, this is what we're saying. And I've presented to policymakers as well, so deputy ministers and ministers, and was nervous about what their reaction would be. But their reaction is actually often, thank you so much for saying this, because you're exactly right. Even people working in the policymaking system get frustrated with, well, we only have a four-year election cycle and they change priorities on us all the time and we can't figure out how to do proper Aboriginal consultation or consent when we do things or there's no space for it in the policymaking process. So I actually get um, quite often pol uh, positive feedback because both both policymakers, whether they're Indigenous or not, recognize the limitations of the process um, and, and recognize the, the evidence that shows it's not quite working. And Indigenous groups, of course, often tend to be supportive because it's really nice to just have it articulated, sort of the struggles that we're trying to develop policy within. Excellent. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, so before we go, just one more question from uh, one of our in attendees. Um, so someone is asking, do you think the cultural continuity is doable for urban communities? Um, the city of Montreal, for example, has many First Nation and Inuit members. Mm, that's a really good question that I've never been asked before. Um, I think it's totally possible. Um, and I think it's the balance, and, and that's a struggle for us as Indigenous people, but it's the balance between uh, our, our individual ownership on that, so how we prioritize our culture and how we stay in touch with it and how um, we find those supports and those, those access path pathways. I think the other part, though, for the urban area is having places and people and resources to go to to access that cultural continuity. So that's why it's important to have friendship centers or to have places to do smudging or sweats. Um, even in universities now, many universities are starting to have smudging policies, um, ceremonial rooms for Indigenous students. So we are starting to reclaim some of that space and part of that is recognizing the importance of when Indigenous people are in an urban community that we need to continue to have access to those cultural supports. So I think you can do it but that's why it's so important to make sure that we have those centers and spaces and people um, available. And I even know that in many hospitals now, there are actually Aboriginal liaisons. So if you are an Aboriginal person ending up in the hospital or have a family member, there's an Aboriginal liaison on staff who can actually work with you to figure out how do we get an elder in, in the room here? Would you like some access to smudging or tobacco or something like that. So I think you're starting to see it happen more and I think it's totally possible. Um, and so just, um, just to loop you in, Cassandra, we have people writing in, giving feedback, and so people are thanking you for your research and presentation, uh, very informative and eye-opening. Um, and so folks are saying that it's giving them a refreshing perspective um, that they can carry forward with them in their work um, and that folks agree uh, that we need to rid ourselves of outdated tools that have not worked in the past. Um, and so uh, that's all the time we have for questions today, but a huge thank you, Cassandra, to you and sharing your work with us today. Um, I think uh, you're clearly a very busy person, <laughs> and so we really appreciate um, the fact that, that you were able to connect to Girls Action Foundation and, and share this, uh, your work with us today. Uh, for those who weren't able to have their questions answered during this period, I apologize for the time constraints, um, but we thank everyone for their interest in this topic.
for those who would like to share this webinar with others, a link to the full presentation and question period will be available online in the next few days. And we will be sending you um, a link where you can find that. We'd also love your feedback on today's presentation. Uh, so once you leave this webinar, a pop-up window will appear with a very short survey. We would really appreciate uh, you taking the time to fill this out. Um, as you can see, the webinar format is kind of one way. Um, and so um, the more we can hear about different ways of doing this or things that we can adapt to make it better for all of you, the attendees, please let us know um, and we'll review all of your feedback and take it into consideration. Um, you can also, if you want to find out more on this topic, you can check out our publications, our online resource center. Uh, you can also visit our website, so www.girlsactionfoundation.ca. Um, you can participate in more webinars. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at underscore girls action. You can find out more about our webinars by going to the Girls Action web website, uh, girlsactionfoundation.ca slash webinars. Um, you can also access recordings of past webinars um, if you want to see some of the other conversations that we've hosted. Um, I also, also invite you to contact me if you have any questions. Uh, Jillian at girlsactionfoundation.ca. Um, and as I mentioned, this webinar is part of our National Network Working Groups project. Uh, if you are working with girls, part of our network, and interested in joining one of our working groups, feel free to follow up with myself or my colleague, Kahin, depending on which group is relevant for you and your work. Again, thank you for attending, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, thank you for filling out the survey and giving us your feedback. And one more time, a huge thank you to Cassandra for all of the work that she's doing, but for taking the time to share that work with us today. Um, so get in touch with us if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll be sending you a link to the recording that you can uh, listen and get caught up on any pieces that you've missed, but also to share uh, with other folks in your network. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.